Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another Geek Vibes interview. I'm your host, Michael, and today I am joined by a very special guest. He's the author of books like Bent Heavens, The Autumnal, The Teddy Saga, and the co-author of books like The Shape of Water, Troll Hunters, and The Living Dead. Today, he's here to talk about his new book, The Ghost That Ate Us. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Daniel Krause. Hooray. Thank you. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, busy, but good. How are you? I'm good. It's, you know, it's about to rain, but what better day to do an interview than during a storm? Exactly. Before we get started, can you talk just a little bit about yourself and also about your book, The Ghost That Ate Us, for anyone who's, you know, maybe not as familiar with you? Sure. I mean, I've written, let's see, this is probably my Say 10th, 11th, 12th, maybe something like 14th book around there. And uh, I really, I published for all ages, really. I, I got middle grade, young adult, and then adult. So I, I kind of mix it up and I mix up genres too, although most of them, you know, probably three fourths of them are at least horror adjacent. That seems to be, regardless of what genre, number one genre I'm writing in, there's, there's always an influence of horror in there. Um, so, you know, it, it has really, uh, kind of within those parameters really swung a pretty wide gamut from fantasy tinge to historical fiction, um, illustrated graphic novels, I'm doing a lot of comics now, um, at least one hard case crime book. So that's, you know, sort of another genre there too, as well. And as you said, I've done a number of collaborations, two books with Guillermo del Toro, one book with George Romero, and then I've got two upcoming projects um, that are coming out later this year, and one's a sort of Michael Crichton kind of um, science-based thriller called Wrath that's written with um, a brilliant geneticist named Sharon Mualam, and then a middle grade series called The Graveyard Girls that's written with um, Lisey Harrison. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've got a lot going on. Um, and, but you know, the, the ghost that ate us, which is subtitled the tragic true story of the Burger city poltergeist, um, is one of my all time favorite things I've done. Uh, so I'm, I'm real glad to talk about it. Um, it's up there in the, my top two or three favorite things. So on, on that note, what would the, the, the pitch for the book be for someone who, is maybe thinking about getting it, but is sort of on the fence. Well, it's a, um, it's presented like a nonfiction book. It's presented like a true crime book and a, a sort of section of true crime that exists is the paranormal true crime. So that, you know, the godfather of that subgenre is probably Amityville horror. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of stuff. Um, I can't remember their names. The, the movies that the, um, the conjuring are based. Oh, the, the Warrens. Yeah, the Warrens, like they wrote a bunch of books um, that were all in this kind of style. And so what I wanted to do, particularly now that true crime is such a major uh, genre of people's reading and watching, is I wanted to create a book that felt 100% realistic and used all the, the sort of tropes of true crime, right down to the footnotes and the photos and captions and, you know, interviews and try, try to make it... Um, you know, most readers that I've talked to did spend a bit of time at the beginning of the book Googling things to see if this were, was part of um, uh, something that actually happened. Um, but no, it's it's all made up. Um, it's the sort of the book version of a mockumentary. Um, and it is about, uh, ostensibly, it's, it's uh, funny sounding. It's about a uh, poltergeist in a fast food restaurant. And kind of where I came up with that is poltergeists are generally associated with families. Uh, and that's not just in movies like poltergeist, but, um, you know, the, the uh, a sort of alleged pattern of such hauntings are that they, they tend to follow a family or, or specifically a, a member of the family. 
And my, my kind of thinking was that jobs really are where we have a, a kind of secondary family. Mm-hmm. I think particularly when you're younger and you're working at a, a restaurant or something like that, you know, you really bond um, in good ways and bad ways with your coworkers. You become a sort of different dysfunctional family. And I think most people realize when they're working that they actually spend more time with your coworkers than you do your family. It's kind of inevitable. Um, so I wanted to move a poltergeist to that sort of family. And it struck me as kind of funny at, on the outset to set it at a, you know, essentially an off brand McDonald's type place called Burger City, just off some random exit on the Interstate 80 in Iowa. But I always feel like the best kind of horror sort of straddles that line where it's, it's almost funny and almost absurd and it can kind of break either way. And then when it does break into full horror, it's almost more upsetting. And I think actually the, you know, now that we mentioned the movie Poltergeist, that's a great example because they, the family in that, in that movie, like there's the first part of that movie is really kind of fun. Like the music is fun. The family's funny. Even when the poltergeist occurs, they're having fun with it. Um, it, it, and it makes what happens later all the more troubling. And that's kind of the effect I was going for with the book. I, I, honestly, I think, I think you nailed it. And it's really funny the some of what you just said is, is stuff that I kind of talked about a little bit in my review of the book that I did. I was writing it earlier this week and, and I, and I picked up on a lot of the, uh, the, the, the way that you were really straddling that line between terror and absurdism and, and almost like you were not necessarily parodying the genre, but kind of critiquing and satirizing yeah. it. You know what oh, I mean? Definitely. definitely it was. Yeah. And I mean, so, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think it comes across really well, but that, 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 um, that intention comes across really clearly. Good. Good. Yeah. I think, I think we're in a, in a, a strange period here with, with true crime where there's so much of it being dished at us that, um, that we're, it's kind of, it's on the border of being a little disturbing to me. Yeah. Uh, I think some of it, you know, really has worth and is, um, you know, good for us in, in a lot of ways. And, but there's so much of it now that inevitably, uh, some of it is just looking at the car wreck of, of someone's life and it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and that's kind of what this book is reflecting. Like the book starts out kind of talking about real problems, you know, like the, the sort of the, the waves of meth problems in the Midwest and fentanyl addiction and, and things like that and poverty um, which are, you know, are actual issues. And then there's sort of a, a razzmatazz of, oh, let's all get distracted by this poltergeist, which is kind of what happens with true crime books. Like there's a lot of crime that really is worth staring at. And maybe that's what is not worth staring at isn't always this one peculiar murder that's just sort of, um, kind of gross in a way and doesn't, doesn't really add anything to any kind of discourse. Uh, so yeah, I, I do have some critiques, but it's also self critique, you know, like I yeah. watched some of these and listened to some of these podcasts and um, you know, that's one of the reasons I cast myself as the reporter in this book is that I, I want, if I'm going to sort of attack someone, I want to attack me first because I'm, 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 if there's a problem, I'm part of it. I, 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 I think the, I have a few thoughts. The first of them being that one of the things that I found almost most arresting about the book was that you are the narrator and you're part of the story at times. And it, it, it blends that line between reality and fiction in such a, almost a disturbing way, especially as I don't want to get into spoilers, but especially as the story progresses and you kind of get more involved in the story that you're telling. We'll yeah. Say. Yeah. I don't see how I, I that's just led from me being, tra- me trying to be realistic, you know, like 
I, I grew up in a town like this in Iowa. I can, I sort of know what these people are like. There's no way that you couldn't as a reporter, like intrude into their lives and not become part of it. Like your, your presence would be such a big deal um, that you, I don't think you can ignore it. 100%. And then the, the, the other thing that I think is really interesting about the approach that you take in the book is that, you know, like, like you were saying, it's it, in many ways, it is so much about these bigger societal issues and a thing that I feel that a lot of true crime and even true crime, you know, paranormal books do is that they focus so intently on the crime and not on the people who were affected by it. But your book focuses almost, you flips that on its head to some degree in that, you know, you spend so much time exploring the way that this traumatic event changed the lives of everybody who you know survived it and that for me was such a a more engrossing experience where i i I felt that the the way that these people were so fundamentally altered by this was almost scarier than the idea of a poltergeist in totally you know, a burger joint. Yeah, it should be. I mean, that's, that was the idea of kind of jumping back and forth between times. Um, you know, for the listeners, I, I kind of uh, go between the year during which the culture guys was active and then present day, which is 2020 in this case, where I'm interviewing the people now and they're all drastically changed. And part of the decision of that part of it is just drama drama. You know, like if you if you see how different these people are now, it kind of adds immediate stakes. You want to know what happened that was so terrible that, you know, changed these people so dramatically. And now they're they're all sort of ruins of people. Um, but yeah, but the other part of it is just exactly that. Like I want to sort of give airtime to the people now who feel not only traumatized by these events, but um discarded you know like for for a while there while they were good for good for social media and tv shows and jokes and memes for a while there they were they were treated as if they had some value but as soon as the joke sort of ran its course they were just left kind of to rot in iowa and you know and that's a sort of a common celebrity culture you know once once the, the joke has run its course, well, that's it. You're, you're left behind just to the life you had, but worse. The focus on, you know, the way that uh, these events change people and they get left behind and all of that. I, I found in reading several of your books that you you seem almost drawn to the way that you know, that, that terrible, horrible things can really mess a person up. Like I'm thinking specifically of like, like Bent Heavens and the autumnal, which both stories to me feel almost fundamentally about the main characters, either past trauma or current trauma. And, and so I'm kind of curious for you, is, is there something about the horror genre that feels like a really big conduit to tell those kinds of stories? Or is that just the kind of story that you were drawn to tell? Well, that's interesting. I'm kind of looking at my bookshelves now. And I think, I I think largely that isn't the case for most of my books, but I think you're right. I think for this one in autumnal bent heavens and probably scour, they are about that. Like somebody being someone kind of working through uh, something, I guess you could say traumatic in most cases. Um, and trying to put the pieces back together. Uh, I, yeah, I think, I mean, I think horror is a, is a good place to do that, but I think it's a pretty universal theme. I think um, you could look at, you could probably find that, that theme in everything. You probably see it in romance. You could probably see it in um, uh, like a noir type of detective, you know, 
who's kind of had a broken career in life and is trying to put it back together. I think it's, it's a essential, one of the kind of quintessential places to start a character is sort of post post trauma. Um, and the ghost of Ada sort of, you know, has its cake and eats it too, by <laughs> presenting both sides, you see them, you know, these sort of bitter shells of people now, but then you flip back to when they were, you know, a few years ago when they were working at Burger City and they're all kind of, at least at the beginning, kind of happy and excited about this poltergeist that's bringing them all this attention. And then as the book progresses, that maybe isn't the case anymore. Yeah. The, I mean, the sort of concept is to not, as is the case in most of these kinds of books, these paranormal true crime books, is you don't ever really know if there's a ghost or not, or if there is a poltergeist or not, you know, like almost everything bad that happens is really just interpersonal dynamics. Yeah. And sort of the exploding of everyone's um, interpersonal issues with other people they work with, which we, everyone who works with, you know, has relationships with coworkers has these issues. But in this case, the poltergeist, or the appearance of a poltergeist just acts as the catalyst and everyone's relationships kind of explode. So you, you, there's a reading of this book where there isn't a poltergeist and it's just, you know, some sort of flukish event and it makes everyone explode. I'm, I'm not going to lie that that was honestly, as much as I personally love paranormal stories, that was really the, um, the vibe that I had for, yeah the vast majority of the book was that it was just this terrible thing that happened that wasn't at all paranormal. Yep. Um, which I thought was just a really fascinating way of, of reading that. Cause it, cause it, fictional Daniel Krauss was certainly taking the stance or at least it felt like he was taking the stance that, you know, it was all made up and it, it like, was like an excuse to shift blame from, those who maybe should be blamed right which i just think is such a a fascinating way of combining those two genres together because normally you've got something like the warrens where they're they're very much trying to prove that this this event was haunt was a haunting right Mm -hmm. and or you've got something on the other side of the spectrum that is very firmly you know, just we're going to tell you all the nitty gross details about this murder and it's just going to be a whole thing. And, and the, the ghost that ate us kind of lives in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's accurate. That's it, it's trying to do a lot of things, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that's that's those were all the appeal factors. For me, definitely. Um, and kind of on that note, given all the research you had to do and and you know, the, the viewpoint that the book takes, do you personally have any belief in the paranormal? No, I don't really. Um, I'm kind of one of those people who would love to believe in it. Like, I think it would be, I would love to have an experience that changed my mind. Like I, I'm, I'm highly open to that, but I, but no, I don't, I don't really believe it. It would take an experience for me to believe it. Um, I think in in all likely circumstance, these are these events you hear about are, are most likely like the events in the Ghost of the Data's, where there is something that's unexplained, and just because it's unexplained doesn't mean it's supernatural. And then the people around it, it sort of galvanizes the people around it to either undergo a kind of hysteria um, or to fabricate something. And, you know, history is filled with examples of both of those. Uh, I think it's much more likely in, in every case that that's what's happening. That's, that's super fair. I, I think I tend to kind of think along those same lines and that it, it's a fun thing to think about, but it's also highly unlikely. Yeah. Keeping on the same kind of thought line of your research, um, I'm sort of curious what did you like, like what kinds of, you know, true crime documentaries or, or paranormal books or, 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 you know, whatever 
did you kind of delve into for this? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't really re- recall too many specifics. I, I was sort of, you know, I'm someone who's not obsessed with true crime, but certainly partakes in enough of it. Like I've seen my share of uh, documentaries and documentary series. Um, I'd be, you know, like I remember a few, you know, like making a murder. Yeah. Um, the Netflix was a one I recall, but I've seen a bunch, you know, mm-hmm. uh, like the podcast, my favorite murder, which is a great podcast. Um, but then I've, I've dipped into other podcasts that are similar and eventually sort of turned away from them because they felt, they felt more ghoulish in a way. Like it, it felt like there's some true crime podcasts out there that are really, we're just going to recycle all the terrible things that happened. And they're sort of feel bad podcasts for reasons that I can't quite figure out. Like, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not really against any kind of this stuff. I have no problem with it existing, but it's not for me. Um, you know, I'm sure there's people could look at anything. They could look at my books and say, why would, so why would someone want to read all this grim material? So I'm sure there are things that the right person can draw from it. Um, but for me, for this person, um, there's, a, there's a lot of it that feels empty and salacious to me um, without having anything to say about it. I think, I think that is certainly communicated in the book as well, that, that that's kind of the viewpoint that you have about a lot of this. Yes, that's true. Correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't read your entire bibliography. I, I got, I, I started really kind of religiously reading your books around the time The Shape of Water came out. Okay, gotcha. I think this is the first one that you've done that isn't in a more traditional prose style. Yeah. So what was the experience like approaching that kind of a different writing style for you? Well, there's a, there's a, it's a good question. And there's a kind of a number of facets to the answer. Um, One thing is definitely just for my own um, involvement and engagement in a book. I like to change it up. Um, So from book to book, at the very least, if it's applicable anyway, it makes sense. I like to at least change up the, the point of view or the, if it's present tense or past tense. Um, uh, I, ne- I definitely never try to write in the same style. I always try to tweak the style a little bit. Um, but the, yeah, I think the ghost that ate us and my book blood sugar are probably the only ones written in a, in a totally uh, totally different style that that feels radical, radically different than a normal novel on the page. Um, and so, yeah, part of that is to keep myself interested in wanting to create new problems for myself. Like that's really what it's all about for me writing, especially once you get up into the double digits of books. Um, I want to create complications for myself to make my to, so that I can't rest my laurels get up to my old tricks again. I want to come up with new tricks. Um, and I, I feel like, and I had a hunch the nonfiction style would come natural to me. Like it's felt like something that would be fun to do. Like, I feel like I, I read a lot of nonfiction. Um, so it felt like, it felt like it would be fun to write captions and footnotes and write with this sort of somewhat neutral style of a reporter. You know, like usually when you write a novel, you want it to be colored pretty heavily with some sort of uh, drastic point of view. Like, you know, usually I write in, if not first person, then a a close third person. Um, But this, it really pulls back and it feels like a reporter where you're still trying to write artfully, but you're trying to present facts. Yeah. And so how I did that was I created, I did a lot of work up front before I started writing. I, I plotted out the entire book and uh, all the events. Yeah. I didn't plot out the book as much as I plotted out the timeline. So I wanted to know every paranormal event that happened. I wanted to know who was there to witness it. I had to figure out the shift schedules. 
which people at the restaurant were working, which days, which shifts. Um, and so I had, so I had all the facts before me because when you write a nonfiction book, you're going to have all the facts. Uh, and so then the writing of the book was really just reporting on the facts that I had created. Um, so I would just sift through the the fake facts you know, <laughs> that I had created. And uh, also I had sort of a map of everyone's relationship with everyone else and their sort of buried frustrations and rivalries. Um, and that kind of freed me up to just act as a nonfiction writer and just sort of take you through the story beat by beat and present it to the reader to sort of make their own judgments on it. Is that, do you normally plot your books out to that extent or, or is this kind of something special you had to do for this one? I, I do plot my books out um, extensively. Usually um, this was different in that I was, I was less plotting out the book than I was creating a series of events that I could, that I could then report upon. Um, but yeah, I, I generally do um, outlines and some of them are of moderate length. And then some of them are massive, um, uh, you know, for like my really long projects like the living dead or Zebulon Finch. I think for Zebulon Finch, my outline was the outline itself was over a hundred pages. Oh, goodness. Um, and this, these are, you know, they're single sized books too. Yeah. They, oh, they're huge. Yeah. So and they're complicated and I don't want to spend, I'd rather spend a few months preparing the outline and not end up spending, you know, months of writing going down a dead end and not realizing. So I, I try to do that work up front. That makes sense. And on, on the same kind of train of thought, how do you approach some of your, your, um, the, the collaborations that you do, like like with Guillermo del Toro or or the the Living Dead, which I know was written after uh, George Romero died, but it, it, is it a different process for you when you're working with another author? Oh yeah, it's it's a major different. Every every day and every person you collaborate with, um, the process is going to be extremely different from everyone else, and that's again that's going back to the idea of creating problems for myself to, in a sense, collaborating is a, is a kind of problem. Like you now have a, a secondary input that you didn't have before. Someone who's going to suggest things you wouldn't have suggested and come up with a, approaches that you wouldn't have thought of. And you're not even always going to agree with them. And you're going to, it's, it offers you something to bump up against, but, but hopefully in an interesting way and will push you to do things in a new kind of way. Um, so yeah, it's it's very different. Um, you know, writers generally work in isolation. So when you put them together, you always find two people who don't work the same. Um, there's no standardized way that people do this. So it's always a little bit rocky, but in a good way. I, I look forward to that rockiness. It sounds like it would be the thing that would make it the whole experience fun, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's an, it's another way to, to shake things up. And, and for me, that is fun. Like, I think people who, that's not the case for everyone. I think like somebody who's on book 28 of a series, like they're, they're after something different. Like sure. They're, they're after, I think in a way the, the comfort of familiar environments, but, but for me, I, I don't want, um, and probably to my commercial um, deficit, like I don't want any book to feel like a previous book. So I'm doing everything I can to shake up the format and the genre and the language and the working style, um, the way I approach just the, the everyday writing. I want all that to be constantly messed up so they have to readjust. I think it's the only way you can stay vital is to, to make yourself have to think in new patterns and new ways. I, I think as a reader, it's also what, what makes a lot of your books really interesting. I mean, just in the past few years, you've had a middle grade series about teddy bears. You've had this, you know, dark comic book about, you know, a, a haunted town, not a haunted town, but, you know, a, yeah. a, a, a town with some, an interesting past. You, you've had a zombie book. You've had 
this one, it, there's such a variety. So as a reader, it's also just really fun to pick up one of your books because you never really know what you're going to get. Yeah. And that's, it's the same for me. It, it, that makes it fun for me. Um, as I said, I, I don't know that that's the smartest way to approach it commercially. Like generally, you know, the sort of cliche is, you know, create broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Or create a brand and stick to it. Um, but I, I just, I just couldn't possibly do that. I can't, I can't imagine like there's a lot of, you know, like for example, in the horror genre, you'll see some writers and it feels like they're just kind of ticking off a list. They'll be like, all right, I'm going to do my werewolf book. And I'm going to do my vampire book. And I'm going to do my, um, and I don't, I don't want to, to fall back into that sort of comfortable series of events like that. I don't want to feel like I'm clicking off a checklist. I want to do things that are surprising to me. Like, I don't think anyone expects me to write a trilogy of books about teddy bears, you know, like that's the, and nor, nor, nor did I like that's, and that's what I'm kind of seeking out or blood sugar, which is, you know, it's something that's, it has no resemblance to anything else I've done. Um, that's, that's the whole reason I'm doing this is that I, I would be just be a failure if I had to write this, things that felt, felt solidly like a, like a Daniel Krauss novel every time. So I'm hoping my brand can sort of be an unbrand, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, shifting from novels a little bit, some of our readers might be most familiar with your work with the creep show series. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and, and I'm curious, what was, how did you get involved with that? And what was it like writing the two stories that you wrote so far, which are pipe scream and the things in Oakwood's past? Yeah, right. I am. Um... I was one of the producers on the show reached out to me. Um, uh, I guess you just sort of a fan of, um, of my work. And, um, and it was very exciting for me because, you know, George Romero was, was my hero. And which is why when I wrote the living dead with him posthumously, it was such a, an important thing for me. So um, after night of the living dead, my favorite Romero movie is creep show. I just, it was, those two movies were just the two movies for me going up. So a chance to work in the, the creep show world was just unbelievably exciting for me. Um, and then like the process was really simple, you know, like I, I pitched some ideas. They, they said, Hey, like, you know, what, what ideas do you have? And I'm so devoted to pitch to um, creep show and also the EC comics um, of the fifties. I just lo- have all of them and just love them. Um so I'm, my brain is, is pretty trained on that kind of creep show format, the classic, the classic format, uh, which I think you can really see in pipe screens, my first script, which um, without commenting on the quality of it, uh, because I'm too close to it, I think is almost out of all of the episodes of creep show so far, but almost fit the most neatly into the original movie. Like it really has that sort of classic um, come, you know, come the hand, the chickens coming home to roost kind of feel to it. Um, So yeah, the process was, you know, straightforward. I picked some ideas. They, they liked one of them. Um, I talked to Greg Nicotero, you know, on the phone a few times and kind of worked through the, uh, some of the plot ideas and then um, wrote it did some small edits and that was pretty much the process on both of them. The second one was a little different because it was going to be an illustrated or, or an animated episode, which freed us to do things that are typically beyond the creep show series budget. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a small budget. So, so you, you always have to be kind of aware of how many characters you have, how many settings you have. Um, so that, that'll, that, that, idea that I had pitched earlier fit better for the animated one because we didn't have any boundaries like that. That makes sense. I, I can, I, having seen the second one, I definitely I see the benefit of doing an animation and how that can free up uh, the, the ability to explore avenues that maybe wouldn't be possible doing it live action. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it makes sense. You know, if, I'm surprised uh, there hasn't 
I'm almost surprised there hasn't been more of that. Like the, you know, it's, it's a comic book, so it makes sense that it would be animated. I, I still can't believe there hasn't been a straight up creep show comic. You know, like it's the whole premise of the original movies were that it was a comic book. So I think, you know, the rights issues are always thorny. Um, so I'm assuming that's that's part of the reason we've never seen just creep issues of Creepshow come out. Well, my final question for you is is perhaps deceptively simple. And that is, if you could describe the ghost that ate us in one word, what would it be? Hmm. Boy. Asking the hard questions. I mean, the way that pops to mind is tricky. Ooh, I can see um, that. Yeah, I think it's one of those books that makes a lot of gestures and feints in different directions that makes you think it's sort of about something, but it's about something else. You know, the whole book is constructed as a, a sort of trick. You know, even the, the format of it is a, a bit of a trick. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, you know, there's a lot of little traps sort of hidden within it. And um, misdirection is a big part of it. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this interview with us. Of course. Anytime. It's always my pleasure. So for all of our listeners, uh, The Ghost That Ate Us comes out on July the 12th, and there will be links to where you can order it in all of the description on whatever service you're listening to this. And Daniel, can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yes. So you can find me at danielkraus.com, and that will lead you everywhere else. And you'll be able to find the book everywhere. And there, there's an audio book coming out as well from Random House Audio, which should be pretty much simultaneous with the print. Thank you so much for doing this again. Hey, thank you very, very much. Have a great day. You too.